Yeah, I'm Andrea Jones. I'm um, from Brighton and Hove Community Land Trust. There's a number of other members from the Community Land Trust here as well. Um, Peter and Rita over there. Um, and I'm here because we're um, involved in developing community-led housing projects for groups that want to sort out their own housing solutions. So, have, if you can just put your hand up if you've got a... Can you hear me? Sorry. Um, if you've got a question, Julian has a question. Uh, some of you, if you're close, I will bring the mic to you to, to ask the question, and some of I'll ask from the back and paraphrase it so we can all hear. Julian. Hello, um, I'm Julian from Sussex Co Housing. Um, I heard what you said, Melissa, about there not being evidence for the, um, the benefits of. Uh, living together, and the kind of mutual support that we like to advocate. I'm surprised about that. I'm really interested to see your research. But I've also heard that there might be, evident, there might be evidence of communities like co-housing having a beneficial effect on their neighbourhood. And I'm wondering if there is evidence of that. OK. okay. Um... Yes, you're right that that claim is absolutely made. I know that you know that's one of the things that Ouch uh, kept kind of um, presenting to local authorities around London when they were rejected time and again about you know how they could bring something rather than um, draining the social services, which is the way that local authorities saw it as an old group of people that was going to come and use you know their healthcare or whatever. Um, I haven't come across evidence per se of, of that, you know, more than kind of um, anecdotal things or studies here and there, but something kind of more longitudinal or systematic. Um, I can say from the ouch perspective, um, what I found is that the women talk a lot about the first years at least, spending a lot of time with themselves, getting to know each other, and that actually they need to dedicate a lot of energy and time to that if they want the group to work before doing too much with the community. So they're all open to working, and, and actually they're all involved in something with the community. So that, that's absolutely true. But in terms of how they um, speak about it, they, they see it as a future endeavor of actually um, engaging perhaps in things like bringing the community into their, into their co-housing team. Ouch in particular also has researcher and media fatigue. So they're now very wary of involving themselves with anybody very much at all. So I think they need to get over that a little bit before doing more. Has anyone else on the panel got anything to add relating Kelvin? Thank you. I think um, there's a lot of evidence out there that if you start building social capital, you start building self-organization at the lowest possible level, people are more than willing to extend that self-organization to a wider community. I think it's in the nature of how people have come together. There's some very good evidence in, in the states in places like Baltimore, Cleveland, Detroit, where um, cooperative housing or co-housing has led to f the development of far greater levels of social capital in communities. I think the Berlin Townhouse Project, one of its key metrics was that uh, when they measured the success of it afterwards, is because they created that self-organization at the beginning, that led to people coming to the... Uh, the municipality or the local council and saying, well, can we take on, say, management of the street now? Or can we take on um, other services, which he was obviously delighted about? So, you know, can, can we get a crash here? So he immediately looked at these things as coming off his, off his costs. So there is evidence, and I can probably provide you some links to some of those examples. Thank you. And Andrew? So, I'll bring the mic to you. Squeeze that. Um, got a question for Kelvin. Um, yeah, um, thank you very much for um, the talk, and yeah, I was really impressed um, with um, well, the way you presented your arguments, and yeah, I think they were very powerful. Um, having experience, well, having experienced kind of almost like both sides, um, so I've, I've for a couple of years lived in Devon. I was part of Land Trust, and we wanted to do an eco self build and cob and straw bales and all that kind of stuff and encountered incredible resistance there, um, both from planners, from locals, um, um, from, yeah, from all sides. Um, 
Then we, we moved back to London, um, and now I'm working with one of the biggest probably house builders in, in the southwest, um, southeast, um, mostly in London. Uh, very big schemes, um, yeah, hundreds of thousands of uh, units. And I can't see how they can ever kind of converge and in a way what needs to happen to enable that change to kind of occur. They're completely two different worlds um, drifting further and further apart. Um, and yeah, I just would like to hear your kind of thoughts on that. Thank you. Yeah, Kelvin, if you'd like to lead with that and then maybe someone else has got something else to say. I think you're absolutely right. It's like, um, as I mentioned before, Venus and Mars at work, you know, difficult to reconcile those two conflicts. But it's interesting in Berlin, that's what they did. They found that they, by example, they were able to show developers that if they moved increasingly towards being enabling developers, not developing the full process, they could, achieve, they could make more money. I think the problem, the problem we have here is that we, we have just seen housing as a product. And, I mean, I worked for a house builder. Um, I ran their housing and urban renewal group for a, for a big contract at one point in time. And their metrics were how many bricks we delivered to site that weren't broken. You know, so they had very simple metrics. They, because they were contractors. I mean, if, if they built ice creams, they'd probably treat ice creams in the same way. And no one actually really looks at housing as a process or as like a, a fundamental need. I think that's the problem. So we, they're being delivered by people who project things like efficiency. And the trouble is we're playing exactly that same game. You know, we're playing when, when you saw the windmill, the windmills up in the strata building. You know, a lot of this is just PR. It really doesn't go anywhere. And in reality, most of the guys would think, just you know, get away, let's, let's just build what we always build. Sustainability, sustainability is too expensive for us, they'd say. And they'd probably say that most of the time. Or if they do, they tend to sort of um, tie up with someone. You know, buy a regional joins up with Quintain to do something up in Middlesbrough. You know, and it fails dismally. And it kind of lets us all down as a result of that. So we question both sides all the time. So, I mean, to answer your question, it's incredibly difficult to... I mean, when I, when I heard the figures of only 19 co-housing schemes in this country, I mean, that, that, un, that shows exactly what the scale of the problem is. And the scale of the problem is, is also to do with the way in which housing has traditionally been delivered here. It has been tra traditionally developed, delivered by a landowner. Okay. So if you have a look at... I met recently with a custom builds guy, build people who actually see this as an absolute failure at the moment. It hasn't translated into the success that they wanted. Um, whereas if you look at, say, Sweden, Germany, particularly Sweden, 55% of every house that's built is through a custom-built or self-built model. We're not even hitting 3% here, and we're finding it difficult to scale up from that. When house builders uh, are encouraged to do it, they deliver it as a small percentage. It's almost, they almost see it as planning gain. You know? It's the same as we have to fund a, a playground, or we have to, well, let's, just, let's put the custom-built stuff on the corner, let it happen, you know, keep the planners happy. So they haven't engaged with it at all. And I think that's the key problem when it comes to housing in this country, is that no one's really taking the serious issue of how we build socially diverse, mixed-use urban neighbourhoods, rather than just the standard products. I just wanted to finish on one point. There's a very good study done by Yolanda Barnes at um, Savills, um, which looks at what people want. And it's interesting, some of the examples you have, you, you, you'd be interested in that bit of, you know, where she starts looking at the metrics of, and the concept of the neighbourhood is increasingly important for people of generally your age over there, um, which is effectively... Um, what the millennials want. And the millennials want something completely different to what the house builders are building at the moment. So it's strange that we're building products that people don't want. But in, in, in the same way, if that's all you can get, the choice, is, the choice is almost for someone to be lying on the ground with a boot on their head and, and you ask them, sorry, which boot is more comfortable? You know, is it the rubber boot or the leather boot or something? So, I mean, that's unfortunately the level of market research that happens at the moment is, you know, given the choice, a limited choice, what are you going to choose? I'll take a rubber boot, it's less painful. Mm -hmm. I think mean, that's, that's the big issue. Sorry, I spoke too much. <laughs> I mean, what I would say as well is part of the Community Land Trust and part of the you know, network of um, over 300 Community Land Trusts growing up in the last just two years in Britain is it's pushing at an open door. Actually, you have to start somewhere and you have to claim back. Groups have to get together and organise and claim back that space. And that is what people are doing. And co-housing an example of it. And okay, ouch, 18 years. It's really depressing, of course, 18 years. But none of the next co-housing schemes are going to take that long. And it's just, it, it, there, it is important that people feel like they can take, claim back that space. And the, the failures in that sector are so spectacular, that's an opportunity. You know, it is. People, necessity is the mother of invention. Brighton is full of groups 
who need better housing. And it's driving a whole bunch of people. You know, we've got 15 active projects. We've, you know, we've potentially in two to three years, we may have built 200 homes. That's as many as the council built in the last five, you know, five years in, in their regime. So it, it's possible. Uh, perhaps take another question. Um, it's kind of similar to um, what that guy over there was talking about, but um, you know, with the kind of the need to meet these kind of carbon budgets and the government dropping code for sustainable homes and you know these kind of initiatives to encourage sustainable development, you know, what can designers and architects do to to try and encourage clients to be putting sustainability as a forefront of you know design projects? when, uh, you know, it's very often, as we were saying, something that is dropped kind of initially to save money and uh, for value engineering. So I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Thank you. Well, can I just say one thing? Um, because I do think we focus too much as well on new buildings. And of course, if you divide up all the household space in the whole of England and Wales beh um, between the number of people, and including children, babies, you would, everyone would be entitled to a space the size of a big double garage. So we do have enough houses in Britain to live, you know, for people to live perfectly well. Um, it's just not shared out equally. And it, it must be remembered that actually, you know, there is behind that, the a redistributive agenda is probably more important than any kind of green technology approach. I just want to caveat the whole debate about new build with, with that. Uh, I think it's clear in terms of um, models that are out there, systems that are available and uh, examples of architecture that work very well, that they're, it's all out there already. New build, I think, in many respects, 10 years ago, we, we actually knew how to deliver a sustainable home. Um, so I think in terms of new build, we're there. It's just about pushing that agenda onto a client and to some degree managing expectations. Um, everything in our world is driven by finance to some degree and, and aesthetics. Um, we're a very visual, well, as humans, our visual sphere, we orientate a lot of our decisions based on what we see. Um, so when broaching clients and discussing it with them, we make it very clear that this is an option. This is something you can do. This is something that's the right decision to do. And it's also about making them aware of it to some degree. I'm very fortunate that I work with a full spectrum of clients. I work with individuals who have very little money and want to do a sustainable build because they, because they want to, because it's necess a necessity for them and for their family. And then I also work on the other end of the spectrum where I, I, I deal with people that have so much money, they don't even ask what the budget is, they just say build it. And so in that spectrum, if you can bring in that idea, if you can plant it, if you can bring them the seed and say, this is what I think you should do, and if you can bring your take on it, then you're, you're starting that process, even if it doesn't happen with you, even if you propose a scheme or a project or a plan, uh, that it's, it's going in that direction, you're still making that person aware of it. And it's a general consciousness thing of society. It's much more aware, and people do worry more now about the environment. You know, there's a lot in the media, and a lot of that is a negative thing, and we're always told to worry about these things. So if you give something on a plate and say, actually, you can do something about this. You know what we're facing as a, as a race. Here's an option. It, it's, it's making sure that that's given uh, at an early stage. And then as the project goes through, it's being true to those beliefs and those, that agenda at the beginning um, and not letting it get dropped. Because there are, there are always there are always examples of projects that have such great green aspirations, and at the end it's just oh, or that token turbine at the top of the, the structure. It, it's ridiculous. It's green bling to some degree, and it's also what gives the rest of the projects bad names. Um, so if you can give a truthful, honest um, design or concept to the client, and an alternative to what maybe they were thinking, uh, then that's the best starting point, I think. I think I should speak for Duncan Baker Brown, who our first speaker today, who's not not here now. He would say that uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be more expensive. It can even be cheaper if it's the right. You know, you start with the right criteria rather than treating greenness as some some bolt-on extra. Building with straw bales is actually quite cheap, isn't it, Ian? Well, 
Right. Well, it, unless you use me, obviously. Unless you yeah, use yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, it is. Uh, it is, and the materials are there. And if you so wished, you could do a short course on straw bale building. Um, and sorry, I'll just plug in next weekend. Um, <laughs> and uh, you could you could learn yourself, and then you could build your structure. Um, there are things that you have to do on any building. You have to apply for planning. You have to use windows. You have to think about the basics of electricity and various other things. But if you take away those things and you tr entrust them with individuals that know what they're doing already, and you focus on what you can do, you can build your own home. You know, you, it's, it's as simple as that. And it's something that we need to look at, and we need the government to recognise in terms of their policies to enable that to happen, because we are way behind the, the wave. The wave in Europe is gone. You know, they're already keyed into it. We're not in the UK. We really are behind behind it. Yeah, just on that, I kind of wanted to stress what I already said about um, Ouch as a group. I mean, the client there is, is a co-housing group, so it's not just one, one individual or one household. Um, but certainly the architects did a very good job there of kind of pushing the envelope a little bit with, with many, if not most of the women, about um, having these um, sustainable features as part of, of their built environment and um, learning about that in the process. But what I would stress is that while that was true during the design process, what I was trying to put across is that it didn't necessarily then play out once the women moved in in the sense of understanding what the design meant um, with in, in everyday life. Um, so they knew that they had these wonderful sustainable technologies. Um, they understood them in a very uh, kind of ambiguous way rather than in a hands-on way. So this idea of, you know, getting trained about straw bale or, you know, having some hands-on experience during the design process where you come in contact with your building or what the building will be like uh, if it is new build. Um, maybe taking your client somewhere that looks similar um, or that already employs those technologies so that they can kind of play with it and it won't be so alien to them once they're in there because then that becomes a very frustrating experience for them as individuals and they end up then in a way giving a bad rep to those technologies when they talk about it to others. So I think there's something there about um, you know more than just the design and having the material in place but about um, feeling empowered in, the, in that process. Time is marching on. Um, I am going to indulge myself with the final question, I'm afraid. Um, I'm just going to ask each of the panellists for two or three sentence answer to why they feel optimistic for the future. Or you don't have to say you feel optimistic about the future if you're feeling pessimistic, but I hope you're not here. If, <laughs> I, hope, I hope you won't be here if you were, uh, didn't have some optimism for the future. Who would like to start? Um, I think um, 15, 16 years ago, uh, I was told that there was a movement taking place. Um, people were becoming more aware. Um, in, the, in that short time that I've been in the industry, I've seen the change already, and I've seen people's perception uh, of what it is to be sustainable change. Um, events like this, and various other things taken across the country, you can see that happening. Um, inside the construction industry itself, it's no longer just a token sustainability officer who stands there and says, oh, you know, make sure you segregate your waste. It's, it's actually more to it now. And I think uh, I've seen the change within the construction industry already taking place. So, so I'm, a, I'm a rational optimist um, all the time. So, and I, th I think what we've, we're sitting at that position where paradigm has shifted. And I think that, re that repre represents an opportunity for us. There's a door that's open for us to come up with something different. Different thinking, different actions. I also believe that we are a lot further behind in this country than a lot of other countries are at the moment. I'm encouraged by the Community Land Trust. I, I met a whole group up in Scotland recently uh, who are doing this, but they're still not taken seriously. So the real question is, how do we, how do we make you a serious movement. I think that's the challenge we've got here. Um, the mechanisms are there, the act of will is there, but actually most planners would pay lip service to, to what the Community Land Trust are doing, which is actually a real pity. I think the fact is that our professions have to change. I think our professions are busted, I'll be perfectly honest with you. This idea that you can command and control with the mechanisms or the tools they've got today, these things, 
is an absolute myth. But people fall back on that. They fall back on those things all the time. So I think it's going to come from, the movement's going to come from a new wave of people thinking and acting any differently, providing good exemplars. And for us at the moment, is, what I've been doing is trying to collect these exemplars worldwide to show that there are different ways of, of doing these things. And they do achieve far, far better outcomes than we ever would imagine. So, you know, I think we're just at the start of that, particularly here in this country. Um, so, you know, I'd like, to th I'd like to encourage you guys to just carry on doing it. I think that would be my, my advice. Thank you. Um, it is, we have in the CLT, um, we talk about our beautiful vision, a beautiful vision of Brighton where people do live in houses that they can afford to live in and they have control about the way they live. So it isn't about ownership, it is all about the ability of people to kind of live in the way they want to live and live creatively and live differently and not live how developers and landlords um, you know, see look back and form a, a way of living that's based on the past. So, I, I, like you, I, I'm, we see such en energy amongst the groups that we work with. There is energy to do it out there. And I think uh, things are so bad, <laughs> that's, that makes me feel more optimistic that actually um, this is just such an obvious kind of... And, and you could say in England, because it is behind, I think the British system is behind and the British... Um, House building's um, whole economy around it is behind, but there are cracks in the system, and 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 you know the cracks in the systems are being forced open, and we're keeping them open, and you know we're even getting government funding to do that, which is quite remarkable. You know we've been funded by the Ministry of Housing, local communities, and um, to to actually help capacity build groups to do this. So we've actually got some resource behind it, not just goodwill. So yeah, I feel optimistic about that. The capacity of people to organise and do it for themselves is actually. Um, been fantastic in the last couple of years since we've been set up. Yeah, I feel similarly. I feel I'm not overly optimistic about the kind of hyper commodification of housing all over the world and the kinds of displacements that are taking place. I, I, I feel very pessimistic about some of that. Um, but I think the context of kind of multiple crises globally taking place is also then generating a real kind of groundswell of solidarity action and of sharing of information. Um, I think to a degree that hadn't really taken place before and I, I have felt that as a researcher in academia over the past, yeah, seven or eight years and the scale, the, yeah, the scale at which um, networks are being formed, information is being shared is remarkably fast, I think, um, across different contexts and countries and different uh, policy and economic uh, context that you wouldn't think would be necessarily speaking to one another, but I think there's a real urgency, sense of urgency amongst um, global citizenry, if you like. Um, and so I think, I feel optimistic about, about that. Um, I, I will draw a parallel with the world of transport. Um, I've been cycling almost daily in London for 25 years. And when I first started doing it, um, people thought I was eccentric, possibly suicidal. Um, that it was, it was to, considered to be a very, very strange and dangerous thing to do. And now, if you um, cycle in London, you can benefit from a growing network of segregated cycleways. There's a beautiful one along, along the embankment. And in my route to and from my home, which is about seven miles, every week I'm coming across new bits of segregated cycleway that are being built. It's astonishing. And there's been a complete paradigm shift about the potential of urban cycling, which used to be seen as just something that possibly was doable in Copenhagen and Amsterdam, but London, no way, and, and that has changed completely, and I think that, I hope that we are approaching a similar kind of tipping point for the kinds of homes that we would like to see, where they go from being something that is okay for those um, um, eccentric design-orientated Europeans to being something that we can aspire to ourselves and realistically hope to achieve. I've got my own. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, coming to the end of the event, so it falls to me to thank our panellists and speakers very much indeed for all the people who made the breakout sessions possible, uh, for the volunteers that have made today possible for Stella, wherever she is, uh, for organising it all um, so well. Um, so, and thank you all very much for coming.